As the 1950s begin, Aimé Boucher, Frank Roncarelli, and Laurier Saumier are poised to challenge the power of Maurice Duplessis. His war without mercy is into its sixth year. The premier has no idea who he's up against. He picked on the wrong people. The Jehovah's Witnesses see biblical parallels in their plight. Méfiez-vous des hommes, car ils vous livreront à des tribunaux locaux. <laughs> Et c'est ce qui est arrivé dans notre cas. Ils vous fouetteront dans les synagogues. Vous serez traînés devant les gouverneurs, devant des rois, à cause de moi, en témoignage pour eux et pour les nations. Alors, pour nous, on croyait, on voulait cette liberté-là, dans le but de témoigner à ces rois, à ces <rire> dirigeants, à ces chefs. On voulait suivre, mettre en, en marche, en branle, les instructions que Jésus avait données à ses apôtres. June 1950. Glenn Howe is before the nine judges of Canada's Supreme Court. He's arguing the Amé Boucher case. It's the first time the Supreme Court has been called upon to rule on a case involving the fundamental issue of religious freedom. The court was packed. There was tremendous interest in this case. There was reporters and public that were standing around the, the edges, and uh, the, there was a lot of publicity. The Supreme Court justices deliberate for six months. Finally, on December 18th, 1950, by a narrow five to four ruling, the court hands down to Plessis his first defeat in his battle against Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, c'était la victoire, on était content. Oui, je me rappelle que qu'on avait pris ça à la radio. Dans ce temps-là, pas de télévision, on écoutait la radio des nouvelles, puis euh, qu'on a su qu'il y avait gagné en Cour suprême, on était content. And when we won that case, it was a declaration that there was nothing seditious in the document, and all 123 cases that Duplessis had filed all had to go out the window and be withdrawn. But Duplessis won't let this setback finish a war he wages with the approval of Quebec voters, who keep returning him to power. For Duplessis, putting down his enemies is politically convenient. Est-ce qu'il s'en vient des élections? Est-ce qu'on est après des élections? Euh, C'est tout ça qu'il faut regarder. Euh, souvent, Duplessis agissait, euh, allait parler des communistes ou allait parler des témoins de Jéhovah quand il y avait un problème euh, majeur. Faisons la sourde oreille aux propagandistes d'idéologie subversive ou athées. Aucun être humain ne pourra éteindre l'étoile de Bethléem. Elle continuera à briller dans cette là longtemps après que seront disparus à jamais ceux qui veulent en amoindrir la lumière et la province du Québec demeurera la forteresse de la civilisation chrétienne au Canada et même sur tout le continent américain. Jehovah's Witnesses win new converts in Quebec, but their legal problems aren't over yet. Another 1,000 cases are depending on the Saumur ruling. Meanwhile, Roncarelli's suit against Duplessis has reached the province's highest court. On May 2, 1951, Quebec Superior Court fines for Roncarelli, but only awards him a fraction of the damages sought. Duplessis is enraged at his loss and appeals to the Supreme Court. So does Roncarelli. He cross-appealed for more money because $9,000, whatever it was, was, was a pittance, but the judge Again, I uh, felt that my father was right, but didn't want to anger the government too much because he was a government appointee. Duplessis uses his legal resources to delay the case for as long as he can. But he can't hold off the Supreme Court from ruling on the Saumur case. On October 6, 1953, the Supreme Court hands down another narrow five to four ruling in favor of Jehovah's Witnesses. When the Supreme Court ruled that the censorship was illegal, there was 1,100 cases, all of which had to be withdrawn. Oh, mon Dieu, c'est une véritable délivrance. Ça a été très agréable parce que en réalité, c'était loi. On était libre de d'aller de maison en maison et que eux, it, it, il, il était défendu pour eux, le clergé, de s'opposer. Duplessis still thinks he has the power to get rid of Jehovah's Witnesses. 
we had defeated him on the law, the laws he knew, he decided he was going to make another law, which he did at the beginning of uh, 1954. He enacted a new law that was uh, known as Bill 38. It was really an amendment to the Freedom of Worship Act where uh, he tried to take away all the rights that were granted under it. Duplessis' inspiration comes right out of the Dark Ages. As I hunted around, I found that this was paralleled by uh, Torquemada's instructions to the Spanish Inquisition because people could be arrested and held in prison with no charge. They would have to prove themselves not guilty while never being told what they were charged with. Glenn Howe petitions for an injunction against Bill 38 and subpoenas to Plessy himself to testify at the hearing. Ben, C'était la première fois qu'un premier ministre de l'Empire britannique avait besoin de se défendre devant les tribunaux. Et Duplessis y est allé deux fois en raison des témoins de Jéhovah. La première fois dans l'affaire Oncarelli, puis ensuite il a dû aller défendre euh, euh, sa loi ou son amendement à la loi de la liberté religieuse, Bill 38, euh, euh, de, dans les tribunaux. Alors, euh, c'était euh, assez exceptionnel. Il était très outrageux. Et as le cas went on, et j'ai kept asking him questions, and he said, you're a very impertinent young man. And I said, well, Mr. Duplessis, if we were going to get down to uh, personalities, I might have a few remarks of my own. But uh, since we have business to attend to, would you please instead tell us why you didn't answer the last question? And of course, then objecting it. It went on as before. The injunction succeeds, and Bill 38 is never enacted. Even the padlock law is ruled unconstitutional. Duplessis has lost the tools to wage his war without mercy, but there's still one unresolved conflict. On January 27, 1959, the Supreme Court awards Frank Roncarelli more than $45,000 in damages and costs, calling the raid on his restaurant 12 years earlier a gross abuse of Duplessis' legal power. And when the, the um, judgment came through, it was like a relief. Uh, it wasn't sort of a relief from a burden on him. It was a relief that, yes, I was right. You know, he did what he was right. He knew he was right. He was proved right. The rest, if that's what it cost him, that's what it cost him. That's the, the, the cost of being right and, and sticking up for what you believe. Uh, Frank Roncarelli, on en parle rarement de ça, mais il a été, uh, a tout perdu sa fortune. Frank Roncarelli était pratiquement millionnaire. Et ça lui a coûté 700 000 ou 800 000 dollars de frais d'avocat et de, 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 de frais de, euh, en justice. Duplessis's loss is not financial. His party, l'Union Nationale, pays the damages. Duplessis still hopes to make political gains, suggesting he might appeal to the Privy Council in London. Il se considérait que c'était lui la, per, la, la partie lésée dans tout ça, que la Cour suprême penchait toujours du même côté, etc. Alors, il, il cherchait à jouer la victime euh, et, et avec peut-être comme vision à court terme ou à moyen terme lors des élections suivantes dans récolter un capital politique. But in the late 50s, Duplessis's power is in decline. Il est beaucoup plus contesté comme pouvoir établi. Alors il y a énormément de forces qu'il conteste. Donc quand le jugement de Frank Roncarelli est sort, Duplessis n'a plus le même pouvoir qu'il avait lorsqu'il a contesté dans les années 40. Duplessis will not live to continue his fight against Jehovah's Witnesses. His death, seven months after Roncarelli's win, brings an end to an era Quebec society now remembers as La Grande Noisseur, the Great Darkness. Duplessis' death does not put an immediate end to the harassment against Jehovah's Witnesses. La génération qui a vécu ces événements-là a continué à donner raison à Duplessis, même après la mort de Duplessis, même après la fin de l'affaire Oncarelli. Dans un sondage euh, de 1964 de Maurice Pinard, 68 des Québécois considéraient qu'on devait restreindre la liberté religieuse des témoins de Jéhovah. Ça, c'est cinq ans après la fin de l'affaire Oncarelli. A few years after the Supreme Court victories, John Howe still encounters resistance from a priest while going door to door. He said, look, you either get in the car and go back 
home or he says, I won't be responsible for what's going to happen to you. And I said to him, look, I said, you know, you have the Virgin Mary on your side. I have, you say, you have God on your side and you have Jesus Christ on your side. Why do you need to defend your religion with, avec les coups de poing, avec, with fists? Well, he got so mad, he slammed the door and he took off. We never saw him again. Jehovah's Witnesses now have the law on their side. In the early 1960s, Prime Minister John Diefenbaker's government enacts the Bill of Rights, guaranteeing religious freedom in Canada. Our cases highlighted for the Canadian public the fact that we didn't have a Bill of Rights. Lots of people thought we did have. So it just opened the door to the Bill of Rights that Diefenbaker adopted in 1960, as well as the Charter of Rights. So all these things uh, really resulted from the battle that we put on. Frank Roncarelli never moved back to the country he helped change. He died at his home in Connecticut in 1981. His legacy, um, hard to say, I'm very proud of him. I uh, have a lot of respect for him. I uh, changed my life around. Uh, I keep bumping into people, particularly in Canada. Uh, every lawyer I meet, Ron Corelli, are you on your relation too? People know about it, students study it in school, and I'm sort of proud of the fact that, you know, he did it. And I want my children to understand what this gentleman did for them. The Catholic Church lost much of its power in Quebec society making it easier for Jehovah's Witnesses to hold large meetings, like this one in the late 60s. Jehovah's Witnesses are no longer public enemy number one, and neither is Laurier Saumur. He preached in Quebec until his retirement. Nous croyons sincèrement que Dieu doit intervenir dans les affaires des hommes. On croyait cela, on croit cela encore. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Comment allez-vous? There are now 35,000 Jehovah's Witnesses living in Quebec, and the legal expertise Glenn Howe gained there is valuable to other witnesses. Well, I'm consulted from time to time on cases in other parts of the world, and uh, our experience with both uh, writing and practicing under the and developing the Canadian Constitution has made it possible for me to speak with considerable authority in other countries, too. In 1997, a battle erupts in a town north of Montreal that requires Glen Howe's attention. The mayor of Blainville directs police to prosecute Jehovah's Witnesses for preaching door to door without a permit. Well, we just uh, have another junior de Plessy there who's trying to uh, re-establish uh, censorship. He, uh, it's very interesting. He wants to censor Jehovah's Witnesses, meanwhile assuring all the politicians that they can go from house to house without a permit. So he's got a law that he wants to apply in a very selective way, which is known as discrimination. On dirait que peut-être Blainville, c'est l'exception qui confirme la règle. Hein? Parce que les témoins de Jehovah semblent aussi, euh, euh, aussi zélés que dans, que dans les années 40. Puis euh, les autorités municipales ont l'air aussi zélés que dans les années 40. We'll uh, see how the case goes. I might tell you it's so well known what uh, our cases have done. I have had Quebec judges thank me and Jehovah's Witnesses for what we've done in the province of Quebec. Mm -hmm.